From the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Bracely, presented by a Cloud Guru, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. This is, if you listened to last week's show, this is part two of the Cloudcast that we did uh, with the MetLife Digital Accelerator Program that was powered by Techstars here in Cary, North Carolina, uh, working with MetLife, working with Techstars, really getting a behind-the-scenes look at some of the companies that are part of this Techstars uh, program. Uh, this three-month program that is really looking at companies that are trying to disrupt the insurance industry and lots of different aspects of the insurance industry, personal insurance, business insurance, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, all sorts of different things. Um, And last week, we had a chance to interview three different companies. This week, we're going to talk to three new companies. We hope you enjoyed the format. Uh, Ran a little bit longer than usual, but, uh, you know, really got a chance to dig into some of these companies and the founders and really kind of understand the Techstars process, um, understand the mentoring process, understand how they help help companies execute on their early vision or their expanding vision, and then how they move along and try and look at new rounds of funding. So today we're going to introduce you to three new companies. We're going to introduce you to Fix Health. We're going to introduce you to Portable, and we're also going to introduce you to Safely. And these three companies, again, like we had last week, really look at three different aspects of the insurance industry. And I think what you're going to find is, in a lot of cases, these are things that are very applicable to your life and may be interesting to you either to follow the company or potentially uh, get involved with these products as they as they grow and mature. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with Fix Health. We're going to talk to Mike Tinney, who is the founder and CEO. Uh, they are a company that has been evolving over time, and uh, we'll get to know Fix Health. All right, folks, we are back here in the MetLife building here in Raleigh. Uh, we've been Spending the day with uh, both the folks from MedLife, from uh, obviously from TechStars, and focusing a lot on some really interesting companies, some interesting entrepreneurs, people that are um, very focused not just on the insurance aspect, which obviously MedLife has, you know, everybody knows them from, but really looking at, you know, how do we we make people's lives better? How do we make their wellness better? Um, make it interesting so that people want to improve their lives and, and take an ownership in it. So, um, very excited to have a company that, that's really not only starting to do this more and more, but has been doing it for quite a while. So very excited to have uh, founder of Fix Health, Mike Tenney. Mike, welcome. Hey, hi. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. Um, We, you know, we love finding, you know, we we talk a lot to to companies out of Silicon Valley, but we love finding companies that aren't. You guys are based in Atlanta. Yeah. Give us a little background because you, you're a little bit unique in this in that you guys have been in business for a little while and you're going through some transformations of growth and so Mm -hmm. forth. We are, yeah. We're, I guess, we're kind of the the, the teenager in the program. <laughs> um, we have had a uh, uh, a product in the corporate wellness space now for about three years. Um, we launched the new uh, updated version of it last year, so it's still relatively young in its current format. But we joined the program uh, with an interest to uh, accelerate our business growth. We were. Uh, you know, Techstars takes companies in up to, I would say, mid-size, mm-hmm. uh, and so we, they were pretty assuring of us that we weren't we weren't too far along to to probably benefit, and we were looking to diversify. So yeah. we're we're here to, um, you know, take what we've learned and gotten good at in the corporate health space, yeah. and see if we can apply those uh, methodologies to uh, other other problem areas. Right. Um, and the, the thing that's, that's sort of unique about you guys, and we'll get into this in more detail, but, you know, there's some folks here who are, um, you know, they're, they're building an app, they're interacting with insurance providers. You guys are, at, at your core, you're, you're a gaming company. We I mean, are game you're, nerds. Yeah, yeah. You, guys, you guys have uh, gaming, uh, gaming technology. You made it very clear to me, you're not a gamification system. You are a game that is enacting, you know, healthful, uh, wellful type of things. I tell folks yeah. kind of... How, how you connect those dots between you know the gaming technology and, and what you're trying to, to help people with. Sure. Uh, so games, whether you realize it or not, are one of the most effective behavior change mechanisms mankind has ever invented. Yeah. You know, if you ever played hide and go seek as a kid, you're talking and 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 using now for entertainment 
what hunter-gatherer societies use to teach their children how to not be eaten by predators and how to hunt squirrels and rabbits and, and yep. find those things that are hard to find in the forest. Uh, and uh, you can look at almost any game throughout history and, and find some sort of uh, learning or societal application that it, that it served. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that about games. Games have a, a little bit of a reputation for being um, uh, trivial or, or purely entertainment. They are incredibly entertaining yep. and more addictive than alcohol. But, uh, uh, yeah, we've, we've taken the methodology of, of game-based entertainment and applied it to helping people reprioritize their, their health activity decisions. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things that was interesting, we were talking before this was, you know, we were, we were talking about corporate wellness and, and all of us have, uh, you know, at some point, if you've worked for a larger company, you've, um, you know, they've, they've rolled out a, pro- a program. They said, hey, you should do this. It'll make you healthier. It'll reduce your insurance and so forth. But then we're, you're learning more and more that uh, that's sort of a generic behavior or a general population behavior. There are you know, unique behaviors throughout your life cycle that this may become applicable to as well. Is that, are you guys starting to understand that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, how you deal with an injury is part of that, how you deal with, uh, you know, going through a, a childbirth or something, you know, recovering from, there's different aspects of that. Is that an interesting aspect to say uh, met life in terms of, of thinking about how this could be applied to things? Yeah, I, I, I think so. So our, like at, at our core, we are an incremental behavior change engine. Yeah. So our corporate health challenges run for six weeks long, and over the course of those six weeks, we'll take uh, about 92% of the participants up from 3,000 steps a day and 30 minutes of exercise a week to eight to 10,000 steps a day and 120 to 150 exercise or active minutes a week. And, and uh, to give you some perspective, Societally, um, the U.S. Department of Health recommends 150 active minutes a week for yep. Americans to, okay. to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And by most standards of reporting, uh, it's believed that about 5% of Americans achieve that. Wow. So if, if you look at how much is spent uh, on, on the health and fitness and, and well-being industry, it's, it's somewhere in the uh, – uh, I, I want to say – it's about twice the size of the video game industry. Okay. Um, but it, it's a huge spend that we have trying to look like the people on TV, and we just abysmally <laughs> fail because it's not a problem you can buy your way out of. It's, it's, a, it's a situation you have to behave your way through. Right. And we've had a lot of success taking the, the daily pain of prioritizing these physical things that people just generally put at the bottom of their list and helping them move it up more into their entertainment gratification category. Yeah. And so to get to your question, when you think about uh, at our core, we have an engine that delivers motivations and prompts and an entertaining feedback loop for when you accomplish those things that make the journey towards uh, physical activity um, an easier one for people because it's more gratifying along the way, yeah. that type of methodology can be applied to a lot of different areas. Yeah. And at the end of the day, an insurance company profits when people are healthy yeah. or when they return to health faster. Yeah. And uh, it, we believe pretty strongly. Well, we know that we were invited into the program because our corporate health program has a 92.4% completion rate, which yeah. is about twice the industry's previous high watermark. Uh, and we're excited to apply those standards and methodologies to some of the 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 insured challenges that that MetLife's customers have. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's it's always interesting when people can take. I mean, you you, you mentioned early on, you know, games sort of come from sort of fundamental cultural things that we do. You know, when you can motivate somebody, you can get them energized. You can, I mean, you can apply that to a lot of parts of your life, whether it's work or a, or a hobby or, or, yeah. or whatever it is. Um, Walk us through sort of what the experience is, because because I think people think, well, there's work, and then you know games is you know something I do for fun. Like, help me connect the dots of how that game becomes part of what I do in my my work experience or my my health experience. Sure. So you know, it, I think a lot of people listening to this have probably gone through some sort of if they're at a company of a certain size, say a hundred or more employees. Right. Most companies that size have done some sort of wellness campaign. They've yeah. they've 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 reached 
reached a conclusion or had an epiphany where, hey, if we invest a little bit of energy and money into our staff's physical and emotional well-being, um, there's a chance, regardless of how difficult it is to measure, uh, and that's a whole different topic, but, you know, most companies yep. change insurance insurers every couple of years, right. and so you never really have legacy health data, but... Um, you know, most most good companies understand that if I put a little bit into the well-being of my staff, uh, they're going to be happier. Uh, they'll be sick less often. They'll be more alert when they're at work. Right. And over the long run, you know, maybe they can offset some of the uh, the, the chronic uh, debilitating to be disease conditions that 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 Americans are increasingly behaving their way into. Right. So. You know, a company makes that decision, and then they go looking for a solution. And some companies will take what I would just say is the easy route. You've got insurer X, Y, or Z. I don't want to name any because we work with a lot of them. But <laughs> most insurers have some sort of basic wellness platform where right. you have a website. It counts your steps. Maybe, you know, after 20,000 steps, you're rewarded with a picture of Paris, France, and the Eiffel Tower. And there congratulations, you know. you've yeah. walked to Paris. Um, we We decided – uh, a long time ago, not to be in the walking challenge business because we thought it was boring, and we had a big argument about why it was boring and how what would need to change. And out of that argument came the idea for our challenge. Yeah. So it gets rolled out to employees. The company makes an announcement. And it feels like you've got a movie day coming up. There are posters that go up. The emails have a very consumer video game or movie release feel. And uh, you're invited to join your coworkers and form up into teams to see if you can survive a zombie outbreak. Yeah. Uh, the outbreak runs for six weeks long, and you're on a team with uh, three to nine of your coworkers, and you're all working together to collect steps every day to stay ahead of this advancing zombie horde. And blocking your path to the safe house each week are obstacles, usually packs of zombies you have to get around or through. And uh, and so you need your steps to get to the safe house. You need exercise minutes to get through the obstacles. Under the hood is a prescription of uh, of an increasing level of difficulty. So if, if you've ever played a video game, you know that the first level is easy. Right. The third level is a little challenging. And the ninth level, can I curse on this? Sure. The ninth level, often it'll piss you off. Oh, yeah. Like, you'll get blocked. If you play Candy Crush Saga, you know that every once in a while there's this awful level that just bothers the crap out of you. Right. So when you said people have fun, I'll push back on that a little bit and say great games don't have to be fun, but they do need to be rewarding. Yes. You can challenge and bother people in a game, and you can annoy them, and there's a part of the human psyche that just digs in on that if, if, if you think you're still making headway. Yeah. Uh, you got to give them the payoff, but uh, as long as you do that, they will uh, they will love your game. Yeah. So if, if I'm if I'm interpreting that right, there are certain basic human emotional things that we don't necessarily even know exist under the surface, or maybe we do know them. You, this means you don't have to go after a company who identifies themselves as like we we hire people who love to play games. It's like this will fit for everybody. Some of our best success stories come from. Um, you know, folks in their 50s uh, in, in kind of more of the senior levels of their career hmm. that have, uh, you know, fallen out of sync with with maybe some of the habits that they had when they were younger. Yeah. And uh, and this becomes a, a, a an access point yep. for them to uh, to reprioritize their day. And it's 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 incremental. And we I mean. We use all of our dirty tricks. The stuff <laughs> I used to do to keep kids glued to the couch in front of their Xbox, we now get to do yeah. to get people up and moving and, and get them healthy. Yeah. How do you – when your numbers are that good, so 92% is a significant number, especially when you know, I think you told me like the, the average is like 56%. How do you convince – a potential customer that you're that much better than everybody else like uh, what like oh. is, is there skepticism or is is there just a simple way to show it to them so we we're very transparent with our data and yeah. we're one of the only companies that is mm-hmm. uh and we'll show our historical data up front but we decided early this year that the easiest way to do that is to just guarantee yeah so we're the only company in the space that guarantees that 80 percent of the employees that start the program will finish it and we haven't had to cash in on that yet. Yeah, um, we've averaged ninety two point four, so that's a pretty safe bet uh, for us. Um, and 
and we were really confident in right. those numbers. But uh, uh, it's the easiest way for us to remove the speculation from an employer is to essentially just say, um, we're, we'll take the guesswork out. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll guarantee that 80% of your employees will stay in the program and complete it. Right. And, and after the six months, or the, I'm sorry, the six weeks is done, is, do they tend to, to go, we want another challenge, we want another game? Yeah, so we, have, uh, so we launched, I think I mentioned, we launched our app, our updated app version of the challenge in the summer of last year. And we're just now on our, our three-peat cohort mm-hmm. of clients. And so we have a, a single-serving pricing model where some clients will just kind of pay as they go and, and do challenges on a one-off basis. And then we've introduced a subscription model. Like Think of us as like the Netflix for yeah. health challenges where cool. – you pay a monthly rate based upon your company size and your employees have access to a, a, a website where they can just spin up challenges and invite each other into them and do as many as they want. And then every quarter we come in and we organize some big company-wide, more traditional walking challenge. Right, right. Uh, but we have different adventures in the outbreak. You can go on a supply run. You can go on rescue missions. You can do scouting runs and yeah. and, and things like that. Uh, very, very cool. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up with one last question. You you know, you guys have been um, – uh, Fix has been in the market for, for a while. Um, you guys have been successful. Like you said, you're going through a pivot. What does uh, what does Techstars bring to you that maybe you weren't able to do by yourself, uh, you know, a year ago or something like that? Yeah. So I, first of all, I, I'd clarify <laughs> um, we're – we're here to diversify, not pivot. Like, yeah. We're happy with our wellness business. Um, yeah, obviously, we always think it could be bigger, but sure. we have a we have a, a comfortable little engine that that works right. and and provides for us. But we were looking to disrupt ourselves mm-hmm. and uh, disrupt our thinking and and really accelerate our ability to spin up a new product line. Okay. And rather than taking a year or two, uh, you know, we know we believed that three months in TechStars would 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 give us a year's worth of velocity okay and five weeks in i'm feel like that was a correct good, statement so good far good choice excellent excellent well uh mike tinney thank you for being on thanks uh, for having very, me very very cool to see really a different way of thinking about this and i think uh you know the thing the thing that's been interesting is um you know gaming is is becoming a part of everybody's life we're seeing you know major changes in iphones just because of you know gaming being a popular platform so great to see it not only becoming part of what we do in our corporate life, but being really successful in our corporate life. So excellent. Best of luck to you. Thanks. Uh, Folks, uh, we'll we'll follow up, but thank you for the time. I uh, appreciate you having me. You bet. Thank you. Okay, that was Mike Tinney with Fix Health. And for our next guest, we're going to introduce you to a company called Portable. Portable uh, is going to, is a company that's based out of London, England. Uh, they have two guests on this segment, uh, both Mike Minette and Ali Lanning, who are the co-founders. Uh, Portable looks at uh, life insurance and insurance benefits for freelancers in the gig economy. So let's get to know both Mike and Ali from Portable. And we are back. We are back here at Techstars here in Met Life in Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, very excited to have a chance to talk to both Mike Minette and Allie Lanning, the sort of uh, co-founding team, the founding team of Portable. Um, you folks are trying to help insure and help keep safe uh, freelancers. So sort of insurance for freelancers, folks that, you know, is becoming more and more of a, of a growing population of workers. And um, obviously those folks maybe working for different people, but want to make sure that from job to job to job, they're insured. So welcome to the show. Um, tell us a little bit about how this, this partnership got started and, and a little bit of your backgrounds before we talk about Portable. Yeah, great. I mean, um, there was just something you said there in the introduction which triggered my mind as where this whole thing came from. Mm-hmm. And it's probably a good place to start. And it was around, there is this macro shift going on, if you like, in, from the world of full-time employment into the world of the free, we call it, which picks up everything from the gig-based Uber driver down one end of the spectrum all the way through to the baby boomer silver surfer um, two to three day a week consulting at the other end right and this is a huge global phenomenon and a macro market shift to the point where 60 percent of the workforce is going to be sitting on that side of the fence as opposed to the traditional full-time employment model right employer and employee and that's kind of what got us started on this uh, because we are both um, have been long-term consultants contractors uh, independence, 
and um, and sensing that there is this, this shift going on. And when you go from full-time employment to being out by yourself, you've got none of these sort of layers of protection or, or, or security in place. Right. So you're running huge risks because if something goes wrong, right. uh, it falls apart pretty quickly. Well, and it's, and it's time-consuming. You want to be focused on things that make money, and, and they want to focus on you know other things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and fundamentally, I, I think our, we've got a, a global mission, if you like, which is just to help freelancers to live well. But sitting underneath that, we're looking to do time, money, and stress. Yeah. So you, you're right. Uh, research is showing us that these people are managing now between seven to 12 relationships just to try and keep their little independent business of one afloat, mm-hmm. which has taken them away from the, the sort of the fun part and the value creation work, which is what they kind of aspired to in the first instance. Right, right. Ali, uh, what, fill us in on, on your kind of role in, in making this successful, but, but making it appealing to people, your background in, in having worked in this space for a while? Sure. So um, so I'm a freelancer as well, as Mike said. Um, been been that way for probably about five years now, so kind of familiar with the pain points. And mm-hmm. actually our whole team is made up of contractors and freelancers. Okay. Um, so we've kind of um, been there and done it. Uh, so we'd like to say that Portable is for freelancers by freelancers. Um And my background is in user experience and product development primarily um, and also a bit of proposition development. Um, So I guess what I'm trying to do and and our vision really is to have um, a portable experience so that rather than having to deal with, you know, your your insurance providers for X number of products that you just come to us, become a portable member and we just deal with the whole thing for you. Um, And that you also can then lean on that network of people around you who, like us, know your pain points, uh, know what you need, can help and support each other. Okay. Um, obviously, folks are, are probably picking up uh, with, with the accents. It's a little different than a lot of times we're talking to folks in the States. Um, being from the UK, being from outside of the States, how much of what your focus is is on um, kind of global products, or are you focused mostly on, on the UK, on, on Europe, and um, kind of that, that focus area? Yeah, look, it's a great point. I mean, so, uh, from Australia originally, but long term now living in London. And we set up our base camp in London. It's the market we know and our network's strong there. We always had a global ambition. I mean, it, most entrepreneurs do. Sure. But there's method to our madness um, because at the end of the day, there's also this global village, digital nomad um, movement going on now. Right. Which is this portability aspect that we're trying to tap <clears throat> into. So we might have someone who, who lives uh, by day in London, but they've taken a three month contract over in Europe or across in the States. Right. Someone who lives in the States and has got a contract up in, in Canada or Mexico. Um, so we see this global trend and global movement of, of work by individuals networked in remote teams and that's the sort of the space that we're trying to play in so we need to be global in our thinking mm-hmm. and then the sort of the support will be at the local level um, which is why it's been brilliant to sort of have access not only to tech stars which kind of thinks and rolls that way right. naturally anyway now the global village but also metlife you know they're a global a, a global um insurer brilliant partner um it just so happens that our first test market, if you like, is this brilliant opportunity now coming out of uh, Cary, North Carolina, right. into the U.S. Uh, we've been doing the research; the trends hold across the pond, yeah. um, which we, you know, we're just validating that, and um, uh, and away we go. Yeah, no, that, that that's great. I, I know, you know, just from the little bit that we even do with the podcast, um, we, you know, we we contract out certain things. We've got people who help us do logos and designs and music and other things like that. So it's it's something that everybody needs. Uh, you don't always think about the kind of the results of the people on the other side of it all the time. Um, Alec, help me a little bit. You, you made a mention you want to be, um, you know, essentially you want people to have a portable experience. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, freelancers, like you said, could be working with a lot of different companies and their their things change. How do they? think about it so like if i were to change jobs but i go to another large company Mm -hmm. i may or may not deal with the same insurer if it just coincidentally um how do people have a sense through the the portable experience maybe will they keep the same doctors or what's the thinking behind you know how do you keep things um great for freelancers but then what's their experience on the the medical side or health side yeah so so that's interesting you talk about the medical and health side because that's a huge learning curve for us Mm -hmm. because uh, operating up until now out of the UK, 
uh, it's just a completely different issue, right. completely different pain points. Uh, so we're kind of on a learning curve when it comes to health. Mm-hmm. Um, we're trying to validate whether that's a good thing that we can provide or mm-hmm. whether that's just you know too complex at, at the moment for us to go there as, right. a, as a go-to-market strategy. So uh, that one is particularly up in the air okay. at the moment. But I guess um, overall insurance is kind of the bit that no one really wants to think about too much you just need the peace of mind and reassurance that it's there that you're covered that you've got the right stuff in place so that initial sort of contract between portable and its members um, is really the place where the insurance part happens and then it's stuck to the back of the bus Uh, and the engagement moving forward is you're now part of this group of people who know what you know who know who experience what you're experiencing on a daily basis when it comes to finding a new gig and uh, finding work and getting recommendations uh, and all the kind of unique experiences of being a freelancer right. so we're getting all these stories coming in from people about you know what it feels like to be a freelancer that goes into a corporate environment and being the only contractor on the floor you know and all the kind of experiences that come with that and how you handle that so I think on a kind of daily or weekly uh, engagement level, that's the bit that will be at the front. Gotcha. gotcha. But, I mean, it makes sense. It's, you, you want them to have an experience and then and then not think about it, right? You, yeah. know, you, you, you don't necessarily want them to go, oh, I forget the name of that portable or portable, whatever the company was, but, no. but, but, but what happens behind the scenes in terms of making sure that they're covered or who you work with, yeah. like you kind of want them to, to forget about that. Absolutely. We just want them to put one check in the box. You right. know, I've dealt with insurance, but now I'm part of this community and I can start leaning on them for whatever I need going yeah. forward. Yeah. Um, interesting aspect. Um, I think a lot of times people think of Techstars as it's, uh, a bunch of young kids. This is their first. You know, they had an idea. Um, this is their their initial what, thing. What you are guys, you, you guys are. <laughs> no, 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 no. My 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 question is around. Um, you are sort of serial entrepreneurs. You've you've started companies. You've sold companies. What's the motivation? You know, like help me walk through for somebody who's done this before what drew you to tech stars as opposed to saying like i've done this before um that type of mindset yeah that's a really good question i actually get asked that a lot what could you get out of it and um i would encourage anyone who's at any stage of their life journey who's got a business idea or a startup concept to put it through Mm -hmm. if you can because it's not easy to get in uh, any of the great accelerator programs because it just it does so much for you so fast and um, we took the same view. The Techstars opportunity came to us. Uh, we actually had only two days to get our application in. It also required a big commitment to be based here in, in uh, the States for the full three months. Right. So we had to make that decision very, very quickly. But to me, it was a no-brainer, uh, including the investment angle, you know, the equity position they take in the business. <clears throat> because kind of their whole methodology is you will cram 18 months' worth of work into the three months that you are here. Right. So, so critical to early stage success is just, you know, getting through as much work as possible um, to get yourself going. So that alone has been um, has been invaluable, and, and I, I wouldn't think twice about doing it again. Yeah. Uh, even as a serial entrepreneur, the disciplines you learn, the exposure, you know, experiential learning that we all gather, uh, the contemporary thinking, and then just the access back to the whole tech stars network. Right. Not just for the program, but for life after the program. Exactly. exactly. It, it, you know, it's it's brilliant. And it might be even more uh, apparent to us, having sort of been around the block a few times uh, <laughs> before, that um, you know we've worked inside big corporations, uh, you know, big enterprise level organisations, um, and so we kind of really clearly know that things move slow on mm-hmm. the inside. Yeah. And so I think we really appreciate the acceleration part of being in an accelerator. You right. know, uh, we can, you know, the value straight away from being able to get meetings going, you know, instantly rather than waiting for gaps in diaries to, you know, come up in three months' time. Yeah. Uh, I think we really appreciate that. And we're yeah. sort of coming from a place of experience. Yeah, and well, and, and, and people can't see this because obviously we're we're audio, but uh, uh, Mike's daughter is here with us. Um, she's she's sort of off camera, off microphone. But to me, that's something that I know a lot of folks that that, that I work with, people that are in our network, have said like, "Man, I, I would love. There's an opportunity to go. I'd love to go do that thing, but I don't want to pick up my family and move, or that's too disruptive." Like, you're you're working through some of that. Yes, again, big decisions, um, and especially being you know outside of the outside of the country. But yeah. it, it's, it's actually it's no different. West Coast commitment to East Coast. I think everyone has made a commitment to be here. Um, it, we, we just, 
at the end of the day, we just had to make it work sure. as a family. Yeah. Um, Mike has a phrase, family first, which, yeah. uh, you know, we we all have, everyone in our team has different sort of family commitments. And, uh, you know, we're, like you say, we're not sort of 21 years old and, you know, Free able wheel, to, I mean, yeah, able to just like live in mum and dad's garage. That's just not going to happen for us. So <laughs> no. uh, my eight year old was out here a couple of weeks ago. Great. Uh, so she's come out and experienced the whole thing. And Mike, the rest of Mike's family arrives this weekend, I think. So it's a... It's a portable family experience, but it you yeah, know, that just experiential kind of learning big. on so many levels. Yeah, yeah no, personal, professional, and it you know it, if it doesn't mash together nicely anyway, it actually will just cause you problems down the track, right? Because right, <laughs> these are life issues, right, 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 um, and and they'll be at the expense of one or the other. So you know, um, jump in. Yeah, let me let me ask you one last question. Um, obviously, freelancers, like you mentioned, it's going to be sixty percent of the population at some point in time. But that also means it's a really distributed set of communities of people. How do you how do you begin to say how do we get in front of these people? How do we make sure they're aware of what we do? What's the initial thought process? Well, it, it's pretty strong actually. We we just talk about so they're a very interesting dynamic. And you're right, they are they are by default groups of networks. They network together as individuals to make stuff happen, be it professionally or personally. And we talk about going fishing where the fish are, and actually. The freelancing community, the gig community, the baby, you know, they all kind of move around in, in tribes. They are networked powerfully together. They, they, you know, they feed each other. And that's both offline and online. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got some pretty strong lines of sight as to where we're going. You know, after our first line of sight is around um, 1099 IT contractors, specialists, you know, and again, quite specific, um, a target cohort. Um, we know where they hang out and, and live online because because we, we, are, we them. are them. You're part of them, <laughs> and yeah. we've got the empathy. Um, and you know, back to your point, sixty percent of the workforce, but it's growing four percent year on year. So that's where the uh, activity is poorly served by the incumbents. And um, fundamentally, coming right back to my, my opening line, we just want to help help them live well. Yeah, and um, that's no, our mission. Yeah, that's excellent. I, I, we, you know, we say over and over again, the, the the companies that we always find are most successful are that sort of have the, the best strength and growth are the ones that basically live their product. It was the product that they, you know, would have built if they had to or they, they built it because they needed it. And uh, so very exciting stuff. Yes. Um, Mike Minette, Ali Lanning, founding team of Portable. Thanks for being on. And, uh, Thanks for having us. Best of luck with, uh, with, with growing the business. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Enjoyed. Thank you. you that was Mike Minette and Ali Lanning from Portable. The final company that we're going to talk about today, uh, introduce you to today, is Safely. Um, Safely is another company that's based out of Atlanta, Georgia, just like Fix. And uh, we're going to talk to Andrew Bate, who is the one of the co-founders, along with Lou King, who was not on the show. But Andrew goes through uh, Safely. Safely is really looking at trying to make sure that the experience of both renters and people that are uh, renting their property uh, have great experiences and they get great renters. And uh, we're really going to look at how this is building upon things like VRBO and Airbnb and other services that are making it easier for you to find renters. They're trying to make it simpler to make sure that those experiences are uh, well insured or that, uh, you know, we avoid bad renters and and bad, uh, bad people that are potentially providing the property. So let's get to know safely. All right. And we are back. Uh, We are back here at uh, MetLife here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're doing some um, very cool interviews with people around the Techstars program. Um, Techstars partnered with uh, MetLife, really focusing on you know companies that are that are trying to change the uh, the health industry, the insurance industry, um, and we're, we get a chance to work, um, get the chance to talk today with with some very interesting founders and companies. So today, uh, right now, we're going to talk to Andrew Bate, uh, co-founder or you know founding member of Safely, and. Uh, very excited to have you here. Tell, tell us a little about your background. You um, were around the the travel industry through uh, your previous job in, in McKinsey and right. things like that. But what you know what what's driving you to want to to want to start this company and uh, and be passionate around it? Yeah, well, thank you. And um, y- you know, we we founded safely to help a homeowner feel comfortable with who's staying in their house and what happens when something goes wrong. Yeah, because. You know, this house is a fantastic asset. You can make plenty of money from it. You can't stay in your vacation home all the time. But you have to be comfortable with that Internet stranger who's coming into your house. So, you know, I think two things... um, you, two things really helped us understand the, 
there was a need. Right. First one is, like you said, when I worked in the travel industry, I worked at McKinsey in Atlanta and worked only with travel clients. Mm-hmm. And every travel company just hates underutilized assets, whether it's a hotel room, whether it's a Boeing 747 that's just sitting on the runway or people aren't paying as much as they should be to be sitting in a seat. You know, every management decision is about how do you use an asset better. Right. And at the same time, I had friends who would you know, leave their home empty for 48 weeks of the year and they're sophisticated people. It's hard enough to get a first home in society. It, to right. get a second home means you've done a few things right. right. And here they are making what was to me the stupidest decision ever to leave it empty. Right. And and so we started to study and ask hundreds and hundreds of homeowners, like, why are you leaving that home empty? And it's, it's truly because... You know, there's a hassle of renting, which sure. is which is real, and then the other, and the one that came through as being a little bit irrational is well, they didn't want strangers in their house, right? Even though they stay in hotels all the time, they, you, they share the living space with strangers all the time. Their perception of what happens it doesn't at all mirror what happens in reality, right? And so we want to try to solve that, help at least some of them feel better about a guest in their house. Yeah, it's uh, and it's. And it's interesting because it really is. It's all trust. I, I, um, it was funny. I was, I was in an event uh, a few weeks ago, and, and somebody was kind of talking about trust in the Internet. And they threw this slide up, and it said, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, we basically told people, like, never talk to any strangers on the Internet and never put your credit card on there. And now we literally summon p- strangers to come pick us up yeah. in their car, and we give them our credit card, and they take us random places. Right. And so it, it just so much has changed in terms of, you know, we've made it simpler to use those things. We've we've figured out some sort of way to, to trust people or rate people. And explain to us how you guys are, are going about doing that uh, in the in sort of the rental in the business. Like, how right. do I how do I figure out who's a, a good guy and a bad guy? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we we do a couple of things. Um, you know, we have to answer a homeowner's question of who's staying in my house mm-hmm. and what happens when something goes wrong, and. We help them know who's staying um, by – we do a background check on the guest. We verify their identity. We check for felonies. We check sex offender lists. We check um, global sanctions lists like terrorist watch list. But most importantly, we have the industry's only contributory database of bad guests. So if you've rented a home in our network or or beyond and, and we know about it and you've trashed that home, you know, you're going to have some special rental conditions right. next time. These right. are people who shouldn't rent without the right supervision. Right. And and then the next thing we do is we insure the rental for up to a million dollars of primary commercial insurance. Mm-hmm. It covers the guest, the homeowner, and the property manager. And so pretty much if anything goes wrong, you know, we, we have an underwriter and, right. and we make we make everything whole again. Right, right. It, it, it was interesting. You and I were talking ahead of time. I know, um, you know, obviously everybody's heard of like Airbnb. Um, some people have heard of things like VRBO and other rental sites. You know, you were telling me nowadays that, you know, you can go on, on Expedia and right next to a hotel, you might see somebody in a city's home. Like talk about just the change in how property distribution and visibility has is, is changed over the last few years? Oh, sure. It's, it's completely different. It used to be you have a, a, a second home and you put it up on bulletin boards with your, your chamber of commerce and, right. and you tell them about it and then people will call the chamber of commerce and then you, that home will be booked. And then there are catalogs. You could look through catalogs, like mm-hmm. real paper catalogs. Yeah. Then VRBO came along and they, they put the catalog on the internet. And and then wow, fast forward, um, you know, a decade or so, Expedia acquired VRBO or HomeAway, so mm-hmm. now that's part of their empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, Airbnb started and just created so much awareness for travelers that that staying in a vacation home is is or in a, a, a home instead of a hotel is something that's normal people do and is is okay and actually sometimes a much better experience. Right. So. If I have friends, for example, let's just kind of walk through the, the thinking of because of, because everything that we're finding, um, especially with these, is there's a there's a big change in kind of the, the supply chain between yeah. somebody offering a service or, or a property and then finding mm-hmm. customers, and then there's a bunch of things in between that people might have to deal with. Um, are you are you engaged with the the renters? Are you engaged with the the VRBOs? Like how how to safely play into that thing so that people go. Uh, I, I get the insurance, and it wasn't that hard to figure out. Yeah, 
you're kind of describing what's the what's the vacation rental stack yeah and where do we fit yeah, on that yeah, stack sort of, yeah, exactly. um, indeed so we don't have any supply we don't have any homes right we don't clean the toilets or anything like that we we partner um we focused right so far on professional property managers okay it's about 40 percent of the industry people have a home give it to a property manager to manage sure. and what's great is they um they have 80 or 100 homes under management, but they all use a back office property management system. Mm-hmm. And so we've integrated our services into that property management system. Yeah. And so what happens is when a reservation is confirmed, we get information about the guest as well, and it all happens automatically. We can run a background check. Then we we figure out how risky that rental is. So yeah. we have an algorithm that predicts the the outcome of the stay and, and tells us you know, how much damage is going to take place. And then we can instantly underwrite it at the same time. So all this happens through a connection with the back office property management system. Yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, the, you think about that, you, you know, the world has gone from, you know, your business was a, you know, it was a building, it was a brick and mortar, then it was a website, then it was a, you know, a, an app on your phone. And now it's essentially it's an API. Yeah. You guys are an API right. driven business. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We spend all of our developers time, all of our time making those those services available via API better. Our yeah. website's kind of ugly. Yeah. We're changing it, but it, but all of our effort goes into the API services. Right. Um, how... You know, you talked about having access to all these different databases, you know, criminal databases and all these sorts. Like, is that something that is is sort of readily available? Do you have to be an insider to to know how to get that? I mean, uh, you know, people think about those as like very tightly guarded secrets because they involve like – What's the process for for getting access to those types of things? Yeah, and the first thing you need is what's called permissible use. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a reason. You can't just be checking ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, things like that. So you need permissible use, which, you know, when when you're letting a stranger into your house, that's in the United States, that's considered permissible use. Gotcha. So that means we can then subscribe to databases that that include criminal records, that include demographic information. You've been given authority by the essentially the renter to do these types of things. Yeah, the the guest does. Um, does um, you know, give approval for us to run right. these these background checks? Yeah. And the homeowner makes it a prerequisite of, of renting, just like sure. the hotel requires you to show your driver's license when you check in. Yep, makes sense. And um, from there, um, we we I mean we we check these databases, but then. What's really interesting is because we also insure the rental, we see the outcome of every single stay. Mm-hmm. So we're able to figure out what types of rentals, what types of, you know, how well, how much advanced booking are people making, how mm-hmm. uh, what booking site are they on, uh, what's their length of stay, what type of payment did they use, things like that. We're able to start to figure out the profile of those risky guests. Yeah. And, and are, and are you seeing certain – so are you seeing certain trends? So obviously, I mean, I, I travel for work all the time and, you know, I'm in a city for two days and I'm out and, you know, just going to a Hilton is sort of convenient. But, like, are you seeing big changes in, in maybe longer-term travelers in terms of, of them now not using – sort of commercial properties, but using this because it feels more like home? Yeah. Are you seeing those trends yet? Yeah, a, a couple trends. First first is the rise of the urban home rental. Okay. So it used to be if you're going to rent a home, it's going to be in a vacation destination. Sure. It's going to be near a lake. It's going to be near an ocean or in the mountains or yeah. something like that. Now the fastest growing segment is the you know, the urban rentals. So yeah. you're in Atlanta, you're in Raleigh, you're in New York, and you know that causes more problems you know, because you have neighbors nearby. Sure. But but that's the fastest growing segment, and so all of a sudden you have two kind of sub trends. One is that you know, millennials are starting to go to work and travel for business, and they're more used to staying in an Airbnb or, or a non-hotel. Yeah. And so when they say, I'm going to stay somewhere, they say, I'm staying in an Airbnb right. rather than I'm staying in a house, I'm staying in yeah. a hotel. Yeah. And and so that's just their mindset as they're traveling. And then also for everyone, if especially a longer term stay, if you're in town for a consulting project, well, it's pretty nice to have your own kitchen yeah. and to have you know a little bit more space and, right. and that, that home rental or... Yeah, condo rental sense. works really well for that. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, obviously, we're we're here in TechStars. You know, when you're anywhere you're in these types of environments, it's just tons of ideas and a lot of brainstorming. And I, I can imagine there's a certain aspect of like you're collecting a bunch of data, which gives you trends. So we just talked <laughs> about trends, and then there's got to be a part at some point. If you're having a beer, you're talking to somebody, where you start going like, well, if I know these trends about where they're staying, there's probably the opportunity to say like. Well, they have to eat, 
or they have to like mm -hmm. you know how do we how do we build an API that's going to tie into Grubhub that would become another like how much do you have to stay really focused on this business and then how much do you start sort of wandering off and the you know the whiteboards become bigger yeah. and bigger wandering is bad i mean until unless it's the brilliant pivot that you have yeah. to make but otherwise it we need focus we don't need more ideas we just need to keep doing what we're doing right but stay aware of of the environment to make sure we're, we're right. still doing the right thing right um you you your background um you know we were talking earlier you've done some entrepreneurial things as well mm -hmm. um how does this compare to having done it yourself before in terms of, you know, the acceleration or the support system around it? Is it, you know, is it, is it better? Is it harder? Is it, is it just the time crunch different, different? Like what, how are the two comparisons? Yeah. Um, you know, th this one, I mean, so, so the last year we've been growing really quickly yeah. and, and that, that part I hadn't gotten to yet. Right. So, so it's new problems. They're, they're far more fun problems. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it turns out if our technology breaks, people call us and they're mad. Yeah. Whereas before it would break all the time and no one, no yeah. one called. They yeah. didn't care. So, so, you know, it's, it's, we're spending the same amount of time. We're working just as hard. But, but it is, is, is a lot nicer to do this for customers yeah. and be solving a real problem rather than being stuck at the wireframe stage or the right. PowerPoint stage and, and trying to get that initial traction. Right. You guys are in Atlanta. Atlanta, obviously, you know, world-class city, but maybe not necessarily thought of like, you know, Silicon Valley in terms of, you know, tech, you know, tons of, tons of enterprise companies and so forth. Um, some of what you guys do is, is AI and ML and trying to sort through these things. How hard is it to find that kind of talent? Obviously, like Georgia Tech is nearby, right. but um, but to a city like Atlanta versus competing against the Valley, yeah, it's fantastic. And I really imagine the Raleigh Durham area is similar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's not a lot of competition. Some people want to work for a startup, yeah, and there are a handful, and and so you can get some really great talent yeah. for normal wages right. and even paying normal wages. They can have a yard and, and right. like they can have a life. I don't know yeah. things that yeah. that middle class families want to have and, and they can do that whereas yeah. you can pay them upper class type of money in in san jose or palo alto and they're, they're not getting a, any sort of yard right, right and so so it's it's good um you know the the corporations train mm -hmm. people really well so there's managerial talent both tech and non-tech yeah. and it's you know, the employees are they stay longer yeah you know, they're, they're not jumping from Facebook, then to Google, then over to Apple, right, then right. to the next hot startup. Right. It's and, a part of their life. Yeah. It's not just their resume. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I think it's really hard to get, like, escape velocity, get that initial traction right. in a smaller city. But once you're there, it's a great place to scale. Yeah, yeah. And Atlanta's a great city. I, uh, and it's a great city. It's a great city. And you got the sports and the restaurants and everything else. You got and, it. And things that people love. Well, very, very cool. Um, you know, last thing, what's the... What's the what's the general pitch that you're making to you know like you said you've, you're you're going after forty percent of sort of property managers mm -hmm. but like what's the what's the pitch to get the next bunch of them what's the what's the thing that they go yeah you guys you guys make sense for us yeah there there are two things one is you know these property managers their customer is an individual homeowner mm -hmm. who's reluctant about you know about renting for yeah. the first time yeah. I mean they see their neighbors making a ton of money and they're like I really should but. I don't. I, it's kind of weird, and so these property managers can recruit these new uh, new homeowners a lot more easily when they say, "Well, every guest goes through this type of due diligence, yeah. powered by Safely, and then comes with a million dollars behind them in primary insurance." That gets some of them, not everyone, but that gets some of them over over the challenges of, of starting to rent. And then the other thing that really resonates is, you know, when there is a bad stay, and it mm -hmm. happens a couple percent yeah. of the time. When there's a bad stay, we at least can make that that bad situation neutral. Yeah, not great. It's still bad. Someone trashed your house, Somebody but but still, yeah. you got it. But but there's still we pay for it. The property manager doesn't have to try to charge the homeowner for that damage. Going after the guest is hard. You'll usually lose a credit card chargeback. They'll write a bad review. So yeah. it's just kind of nice to have someone in the middle to operationally smooth everything out. Right. Right. Well, and I got to imagine at the end of the day. The property manager's biggest challenge is, is, you know, he doesn't want turnover. He just wants people to keep coming back, keep coming back. It. And anything you can do to, to ease, that, uh, ease that process is helpful. Well, very, very it. cool. Well, uh, Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Best of luck to everybody. Uh, best of luck to you guys growing the business. You're not uh, starting from scratch. You're growing the business. But uh, great to see another company here in the southeast doing well. And uh, we, will, we will talk to you soon. Best of luck. Love it. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, folks, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much to Andrew Bate from Safely for our last interview of the day. Um, you know, once again, folks, we hope you've enjoyed both of these shows, both part one and part two. Uh, gotten to know all six companies, Buddy, Enroll Hero, Fit Bliss, Fix Health, Portable, and Safely. Um, really looking at a lot of different aspects of the insurance industry. They are six of the 10 companies that are part of that MetLife Digital Accelerator Program sponsored by Techstars that's been going on here in Cary, North Carolina. And actually, by the time you listen to this show, um, they'll be one day away from um, really having their big demo day, their big reveal to the VC community, looking for new rounds of funding, looking for new partnerships. And so we hope you enjoyed the show. We hope you really got some insight into the founders, into their companies, into the process. Um, I know a lot of people are very interested in, in startups and what it takes to get there. Uh, I will tell you from from speaking to all these folks, just a lot of really good people, super passionate about what they're trying to do, uh, super passionate about the process. And the Techstars folks and the MetLife folks could not have been nicer to us uh, about granting us access to the program and and granting us access to what was going on. So hope you really enjoyed these two shows, uh, gave you some insight into how the process works. And uh, once as, as always, thank you for listening. And we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more podcasts, show notes, and everything social media. And visit acloud.guru for all your cloud training needs.